Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the first um, of the 2020 um, Digital Classes London seminars. This um, this season is entirely online. We've been broadcasting live for about seven years now, but um, but there's this time there is no um, there's no classroom um, alternative. So um, those of you who are watching live, welcome. We're um, there'll be eight seminars in the in the series, um, four in June. And um, the first seminar um, is one that um, I'm extremely excited about, and apparently so are many other people watching um, watching us live on YouTube. Uh, Dr. Taya Sunshield from uh, Oxford is um, going to talk to us about her project um, Pythia, a deep neural network model for the automatic restoration of ancient Greek inscriptions. Um, and I think we'll um, and um, to Taya and um, in a moment one one. Um, uh, Quick comment finally for anyone who is watching live, um, please do feel free to use the live chat box, which is to write a video on to ask any questions um, or for clarification, either as we go along, we'll try to keep an eye out for it, or at the end, in any case, um, we'll have some time for that sense. Please do ask questions and we'll 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 try to get to you. So um I hand over to Hi everyone, thank you very much, Gabby. Thank you to the Institute of Classical Studies. Um, we can start the PowerPoint now. All clear? Gabby? Yep. Okay, awesome. Uh, thank you. Yep. Uh, yep. Sorry? Can you, everything's working? Okay. So uh, thank you very much uh, to Gabby and to the. Is everything okay? We're seeing your um, StreamYard window again. Okay. Let me share this screen. Yeah, your screen shares. It's working now? How about now? It's just loading. Hang on a sec. Ah, okay. Yes. Sorry. We're seeing your screen now, yes. Okay, the PowerPoint presentation? That's okay. Perfect. So, yes. fine. Uh, I hope everyone is doing all right from wherever you are in the world. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, machine learning applications to ancient history and specifically to ancient Greek inscriptions. Now, this is a talk designed for classicists, archaeologists, historians. So all machine learning language and concepts will be explained. So uh, you will not be coming out of this talk as machine learning specialists, but uh, you will be able to understand everything that uh, this, uh, this um, the model that I'm going to introduce to you, the Pythia model and the underlying design choices uh, was all about. If, however, you are already a machine learning expert, then bear with me, please, if this is uh, if a lot of what I'm going to say is already familiar to you. Now, I've decided to structure this talk with an introduction, sort of a step by step uh, uh, walk through the design choices, the uh, implementation pipeline of this uh, research project. And I want to show you as much of Pythia in action as possible. So I'm going to be showing you a lot of demos of Pythia in action. So let's jump right in. I will be presenting the Pythia project, which is a research project which stems out of a collaboration which started at Oxford between myself, Dr. Yanis Asael, who now works for Google DeepMind, and Professor Jonathan Prague, who is a professor, professor of ancient history at the University of Oxford. The result of this research collaboration was the paper Restoring Ancient Text Using Deep Learning, a case study on Greek epigraphy. Now, this text, this uh, article was published by the Association of Computational Linguistics back in November. And it was, and we flew over to Hong Kong to present this talk, uh, this work at EMNLP in uh, November 2019. Now, this project came to light as we were discussing, uh, Yanis and I were discussing how uh, it could be possible for to implement a, a artificial intelligence as uh, assistive tools for the work of the ancient historian. Now, I want to talk to you through the pipeline of how this project was designed and implemented. So let's start with some aims and objectives. That's always a good place to start. 
what did this research set out to achieve? Uh, our first and foremost outcome was Pythia, which is a fully automated aid to the epigraphist's restoration task. Uh, but as with all our uh, research projects, uh, the fun stuff also comes up along the way. And in this case, uh, we also managed to produce PHIML, which is an epigraphic data set of machine actionable text. And the Pythia model is more than uh, goes beyond also in potential for uh, goes in potential beyond the application to Greek epigraphy exclusively because it can be used by all disciplines dealing with ancient text and it applies to any language ancient or modern. Now you might be asking yourselves how do we access all of this? You said it's an assistive tool. It's all open source. Pythia and the PHI ML dataset. And throughout this talk, I'm going to also show you how to access this model for your own personal research, train models offline, off, uh, offline as well. So let's go to the problem here. Ancient history relies on disciplines such as epigraphy, which is the study of ancient inscribed texts, to reconstruct the thought, society, and history of the ancient world. Inscriptions, however, are often damaged over the centuries due to natural or human forces, and illegible or lost parts of the text must be restored by specialists. Now, this is a really complex and time-consuming task, albeit a rewarding one, because restoring a text means getting just one step closer to understanding the historical context that produced this text. Now, Current epigraphic methods for epigraphic restoration rely on accessing vast repositories of information that provided textual and contextual parallels. These repositories can briefly be summarized as a researcher's mnemonic repertoire of parallels, printed corpora and indexes, and digital corpora for performing searches that match word patterns. However, naive string matching approaches can be inefficient as they assume that contextual information may only be captured by pairing characters rather than by discovering underlying patterns in the data. Now, the magic words that I want you to take away from this, uh, from this introduction to epigraphy is patterns and data. Now, learning features from, from data is at the heart of the discipline, which seems is seemingly quite far removed from the domain of epigraphy, and it is that of machine learning. Now, machine learning's capability at learning features from data make it ubiquitous in today's world, from self-driving cars to Alexa to the algorithm that traces our internet searches and suggests where we should spend our next holiday. With machine learning, I mean extracting information from data for a specific task. In this example that you have on the slide, for instance, the machine learns uh, the machine learning model learns to predict learns to distinguish pictures with faces or without faces. In this case, the photos consist of the training data for the model, and the faces are the pattern in the data that we want the model to extract. Now, the ad outcome outcome of this specific task is to train our phone camera, for instance, to focus on faces when taking our next selfie. But automizing the learning of salient patterns in the data uh, is, is what we know as, is what is known as machine learning. And today we can train models on huge amounts of data, the entirety of Wikipedia, the whole of YouTube. Now, machine learning relies on biologically inspired neural networks to extract and learn information from the data. The neural network uses increasing levels of abstraction to break down the data into a learnable format. For example, in this image on the slide, the neural network model is designed for the specific task to learn to recognize the image of a dog provided as input as a dog after having been trained on, in, on images of dogs. But machine learning and neural network models can be applied to a load of real world scenarios. So for an example, in this case, uh, the model can learn to recognize what a lung can cancer looks like from uh, medical images. Now, apologies if you are already familiar with these notions and do not worry if you are not. Let's take this back now to text restoration after this sort of machine learning introduction. 
Because all you really need to learn to know about machine learning for the purposes of this talk is that, firstly, the model doesn't understand what a word means. What it can do is it can learn words as numerical representations. The classic example is king minus man plus woman equals queen or Rome minus Italy plus Greece equals Athens. This is what I mean um, by numerical representations of words. Now, why did we choose to work on ancient Greek epigraphy? Um, well, first of all, for personal interest and expertise, my doctoral uh, thesis worked on a lot of epigraphic data sets. Um, and uh, I personally find epigraphy really, really interesting as a sub-discipline in ancient history for all the information it can give us on many and many aspects of the ancient world from political institutions, religious life, etc. Secondly, uh, the variability of contents and context within this data set of Greek epigraphy makes it a really excellent challenge for machine learning. And lastly, uh, over the recent years, there has been an increased availability of digitized inscriptions. We'll go through some of the main data sets in just a second. So these were the reasons, these were sort of the, the starting uh, blocks for our research project. And here begins our research pipeline into ancient Greek text restoration. So if you remember from one of my earlier slides, I said that data is one of the key concepts at play here. And the natural question is, where can I find thousands and thousands of digitized Greek texts? Now, the reply would be uh, the Perseus Digital Library or initiatives such as the Packard Humanities Institute uh, uh, Corpus of uh, Searchable Greek Inscriptions, the Open Greek and Latin Project. We are indebted to such initiatives. But uh, we can we we must bear in mind the sort of the machine learning maxim, which is a system is only as good as the data it collects. So yes, we do need a lot of data, but we also need a lot of clean data. Now, what do I mean with clean data? When we are looking, for instance, at uh, certain digital corpora of ancient Greek inscriptions. Uh, we can see that human annotations are noisy and often inconsistent. So for the Greek epigraphy restoration task, the text had to be converted into machine readable and machine actionable format. This means that with this uh, case, uh, with, with the inscription you can see on the PowerPoint, um, what we needed to do was clean basically everything that you can see in a red square because that is all uh, information which the model will not, be, um, will, will not be able to use as training data and will just provide noise that will, uh, will uh, lower the accuracy of the model's predictions. Now, what does machine, making text machine readable and actionable actually mean in uh, concrete terms? First of all, we have to standardize the ancient Greek alphabet to include all of the core characters, including accents, numbers, spaces, punctuation, the total data set of, of the total, uh, the ancient Greek alphabet, which we extracted, consisted of a total of 147 characters. Now, then we had to introduce two special characters, which were the dash, which stands for a missing character, and the question mark, which is a character to be predicted. Then we had to use uh, regexes, which is kind of a, a find and replace string searching algorithm to replace numbers, punctuations, the so-called Leiden conventions, which are conventions which epigraphists use to uh, render the sort of the material um, preservation state of the text of inscriptions. Then we had to discard all non-ancient Greek text. We had to remove human annotations, inconsistencies, all of that was removed. That was a lot of regexes. Then we had to filter the resulting text to retain only the restricted alphabetical characters, which we had defined at the beginning, those 147 uh, characters. We then discarded the text with less than 100 characters, and we matched the number of missing characters with those conjectured by epigraphists with a special dash symbol. Now, let me show you what that looks like in concrete terms. Um, in this example, on the left, we have 
an entry from the PHI uh, Searchable Greek Inscriptions digital corpus. And on the right, we see the PHI ML rendition of this cleaned text. You can see that it's, uh, this is what I mean by machine readable and machine actionable text. Now, if, for instance, we wanted to predict uh, Greek, the Greek personal name Apollonius, we would use the special characters, the question mark, to mask the first eight characters, uh, for, for example, in this case. Now, the result of all of that cleaning was over 40,000 inscriptions. And this is the data which Pythia was trained on. The PHIML training set has been open source. It's accessible on GitHub repository. I'll show you later where to find this. Now, you can see that the training set has been split up into train, valid, and test uh, splits. Now, valid and test were held out portions of this data set, which we held out to ensure that the training and the testing data were kept distinct so as not to obfuscate our results. Now, you might ask at this point, how would we know the ground truth if we are clean in, uh, in cases in which we want to restore ancient Greek text? How do we know that the model is accurate? To, to solve this problem, we artificially removed part of the input text. We sort of we damaged the text so that we would know, as in the case that I showed you in the earlier slide of the personal Greek name Apollonius, we damaged that part of the text. We that we covered, we hid the first eight characters so that we would know what the ground truth is and evaluate the model's accuracy. Now, at this point, let's take a step back and visualize the task at hand before moving on to the next step in the pipeline, which is Pythia's architecture. So we have a sequence of input characters, the clean text with specific places annotated with a question mark, which stands for a character to be predicted. What we want to obtain as output is a sequence of characters with predictions for missing spaces. Now, this is a so-called sequence-to-sequence problem. This is basically, if you look at it from another perspective, this is a memory task. We read information, we process information, and we make predictions. Now, to return to our specific domain of ancient Greek text restoration, Many types of neural networks have been elaborated for these kinds of memory tasks. And one of the most successful is an LSTM, a long short-term memory, which is a recurrent neural network, RNN. So the solution to the text restoration problem is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence architecture that uses an LSTM to encode and decode information. But you might ask at this point, if it's a memory task, then how can we access context in information if it were just working at a character level. Now, literature has shown that it's easier to model context based on words. So in the models, in designing the model's architecture, we don't just encode or decode information at a character level. Our architecture also encodes word information alongside character information. And this is to handle context more efficiently. We can't only use words, and I can explain that to you because uh, most of the words are damaged or incomplete. So we must also always include that character information in the architecture as well. So our model works at both a character and a word level, thereby effectively handling long-term context information given by the words and dealing efficiently with incomplete word representations by working at a character level. So. Here you have the architecture. Pythia is the first ancient text restoration model that recovers missing characters from a damaged text input using deep neural networks. As input, you have the damaged text with the bits, the parts to be predicted, and as output, the predictions of damaged text. Now, if you look at the image of the architecture, you can see what I mean of the model working at both a word and a character level. In this case, we used as an example uh, the, Delph, the so-called Delphic maxim, miden uh, agan, which means nothing in excess. So what we did was generate the 100,000 most common, most frequent words. And the model here recognizes the first one, miden, as one of them. Then at each time step, we concatenate each character embedding with its word embedding. And when the words are outside that top 100,000 list, 
or if there is a missing character in that word, as is the case, for instance, for the word agam, then that is mapped to an unknown embedding. So you see alpha question mark question mark ni. And the model recognizes the special question mark character as ones to be predicted. And you can see that the output is the gamma and the alpha. Now let's look at some results. Uh, our ablation study was, uh, we split it over different evaluations. The first one that you can see is ancient historian. Now, we evaluated on ancient historians in order to assess the difficulty of the ep epigraphic restoration task. So we asked some doctoral students with epigraphic expertise to restore as many inscriptions as they could from a selected data set within two hours. They achieved a, an average of 50 restorations. And you can see that their character error rate, the CER column, is 57.3%. Now, uh, understand character error rate as sort of the lower the character error rate, the better the statistical performance. So you would roughly convert that in terms of accuracy as 100% minus 57% equals 43% accuracy, roughly. Now, the next evaluation is LM. That stands for language model. So this is a standard language model that works exclusively at a character level. Remember, Pithy is both word and character level. Now, LM philology is a language model which was trained on literary texts, which we found specifically in the Perseus database, a uh, digital corpus of Greek texts, uh, and was set to the epigraphic text restoration task. You can see that its character error rate is 68.1%. And langu language model philology and epigraphy was trained on both literary philological texts and epigraphical texts and set to the epigraphic text restoration task, a little better character A, rate, error rate, whereas language model epigraphy was trained exclusively on epigraphic texts and set to the epigraphic text restoration task. So what you can see is that the language model which was trained exclusively on epigraphical data is performing best. But this is strange because you might remember that at the beginning of the presentation, I was saying that the more data should equal better results. Now, in this case, more data is worse than consistent types of data. Now, you might, this is, um, this is, uh, makes, makes good sense because, uh, for instance, uh, the literary text which we are talking about might consist of, uh, Homeric, uh, Homeric epics or the writings of Herodotus. Now, if you set, use, if you train the model on these types of text and set it to the epigraphic text restoration task, restoring, for instance, an Athenian decree, you would get a different sort of domain. Now, this is really interesting because it kind of suggests a divergence between epigraphic and literary cultures. And I'm sure lots of you will want to talk about that afterwards. Now let's get to the Pythia model. Um, Pythia byword is our model of choice. This is an LSTM working at a character and a word level. You can see that its character error rate is 30.1%, so the lowest, therefore the most accurate, um, the one with highest, uh, achieving highest accuracy. But look at that top 20 column. Now, that uh, means that we also used a uh, beam, sort of, a, which means that the Pythia model, the, the language model, sorry, outputs a beam, a list, a ranked list of the top 20 predictions that the model thinks are the most, uh, returns as the most accurate uh, text restorations. And in 73.5% of the cases, the target sequence was in the top 20 hypotheses of the beam. That 73.5% is not no longer the character error rate. That is time, the uh, percentage of the times that the correct sequence was in the beam of the top 20 predictions outputted by the Pythia model. So what we have is Pythia, which is both uh, delivering multiple predictions and the level of confidence for each result. Let's do a little recap here. As input, we have damaged text with bits to be predicted. As output, we have predictions of damaged text. Now, given the nature of the model's architecture, we can see which parts of the text input can affect the predictions of each output. 
This situation is called attention. And now I want to show you how our model has learned to attend to specific input information in order to predict the correct outputs. As a sort of a spoiler alert of what you're going to see in the demo that I'm about to show you, what we see here is that same text which we were looking at uh, as an example of the PHI ML uh, text cleaning um, pipeline. So in this case, uh, we wanted to switch the pers we, we, uh, you might remember that in the first uh, slide, the personal name that I highlighted uh, was Apollonius. In this case, we, we changed it to Apollodorus because as you can see in the example to the left, uh, the name Apollodorus, this personal Greek name, appears early in the text. We hid the first nine characters, so we artificially corrupted the text. And then I'm going to now show you what the result was. So what you see is the Python notebook on Google Colab, which is freely accessible online. I'll show you later how to use it. Here you have the input text, which is the text which I have inputted. And I have asked at this precise case to ask, I've asked Pythia to predict the missing characters. As you can see, this is what I was talking about before when I referenced the beam. So these are the top 20 predictions that Pythia outputs as, um, as uh, restorations, text restorations. And you can see that its first hit is in fact Apollodorus. Now let's move on to that uh, visualization of the attention weight. The text is the same as the one before. And here you can see in uh, each time step. So at each time step, Pythia is uh, restoring character by character, the missing portion of the text here. That is what is highlighted in green. Whereas in blue, and in layer one, you can see it with better definite in uh, more definition, you can see that at every time step, Pythia is attending to the character which it is going to then predict. You can see at uh, iteration number one, it's going to look at the first character to predict, which is, as we know, an alpha, and it correctly predicts alpha as uh, its output prediction. Then it moves on to the pi, Apollodorus. It's, it's considering the second character. The correct prediction is P. And you can see that it is attending to the first occurrence of the name Apollodorus, occurring just a few words earlier. And it does this until the very end of the sequence that we are asking to predict. Now, let me switch back very quickly and show you what, how that translated. A, res a little resume of what we've seen. Pythia has predicted correctly the sequence Apollodora, the o uh, OU termination we had left there. Now, Pythia's attention weights are attending at each decoding step to the name's first occurrence in the text. So you have in green, Pythia's prediction process at each restoration step, and in blue, the attention that Pythia is dedicated to the relevant parts of the text. Now, we wanted to trick Pythia just a little bit more, and so we substituted the name Apollodorus for with Artemidorus, which is a name, a pers another personal Greek personal name of a similar length, and we repeated the experiment. So let's go back to the collab. Here you see that we have substituted what before was Apollodorus with the personal name Artemidorus, and we're asking Pythia to predict it. As you can see, the uh, first prediction of the top 20 beam uh, alters accord accordingly to Artemidorus. And if I were to show you the attention weight, exactly the same situation would be replicated. So let's move. Uh, this, this is all to show you how much the contextual information matters to the model's performance. In this case, the context is the repetition of a personal name. And it so follows that the more text equals the better performance. So on a logarithmic scale, which is to amplify the differences, the performance you can see in this graph flattens out at around 500 characters of text length. Now, next, I want to show you Pythia in action. Um, 
we go. So what we are looking at here is a um, it's a, a text which records an alliance between Athens and the Sicilian Federation. It dates to around 360 BC, and it was originally found on the south slope of the Acropolis. Now, I'll move ahead to some more corrupted text. Where are we here? Have I gone ahead too much? No, here we are. OK, so as you can see, at every iteration, Pythia is predicting the missing part of the text. That's going to go Piri, this one, and this one, this one. This is Pythia in action. So in this case, how do we know what the ground truth is? We wanted to evaluate Pythia's performance on uh, compare Pythia's performance with the restorations made by experts. And in this case, we're talking of the very famous historians uh, Rhodes and Osborne. Now, these, in this uh, slide, you can see the results of the top prediction output. In the cases where the text is blue, that means that Pythia correctly outputted the target sequence. In all of the cases where the, the restoration is uh, in purple, the highlight is in purple, that is a case in which Pythia didn't get it right, but in all of these cases, the correct restoration was in that top 20 beam. I want to show you now uh, one last demo. Uh, where are we? Oh, I'm going to stop this because otherwise it's going to overload. OK. Going to give me a little error message. OK, here we are. Once again, at each time step, Pythia is predicting the missing parts of the text. Now, you might be asking at this case again, how do we know the ground truth? And for those of you with a keen eye, you might have recognized this inscription as this one from Asia Minor, which is the one that we've been uh, tricking Pythia, well, trying to trick Pythia on for Ap the Apollodorus and the Apollonius. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Apollodorus and Apollonius names. Now, as you can see in this case, uh, in this edition, we do not know what the ground truth is. All of these dashes means that epigraphists have just not been able, based on uh, parallels in the data, to restore this text, at least in this, uh, in this edition. So how do we know in these cases what the ground truth is? The answer is that we don't, and we need to uh, we, we need to work it out as epigraphists and evaluate Pythia's hypotheses based on the epigraphic culture, the context, etc. So this is what I mean by an assistive tool in practice. So let's talk about results. Pythia shows the potential for large-scale data analysis of epigraphic cultures. Our experimental results have illuminated the ways Pythia can assist guide and advance the epigraphist's task. And we really wanted to show how the combination of machine learning and epigraphy can impact meaningfully the study of inscribed textual cultures, both ancient and modern. Now, in terms of the bigger picture, Pythia is an example of using machine learning to solve more real world problems. So uh, in terms of tracking textual connections and, and correlations with computational methods, which allow us to uh, pass and evaluate over vast quantities of texts, then we can use it to design educational tools for, to explore the data or make standardized and uh, organized data more accessible. And these kinds of uh, long-term goals and results are sort of what it, uh, are what it, the, um, uh, the interaction, the synergy between uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and uh, ancient history, studies on the ancient world, is all about. And there are many uh, initiatives uh, which are combining these two er fields of uh, research um, on uh, textual data, on uh, uh, 
archaeological data. These were just a few examples that I wanted to give you. Now, uh, another, the conclusive sort of guiding principle of this research was, I repeat it, making this all open access and freely accessible. So um, to access all of the models, you can, uh, I will show you now how to access it on the GitHub repository. The CoLab, the note, Python notebook is also freely accessible to, for personal research. You can regenerate PHIML to train new models offline. For more information, uh, please read our article published uh, for ACL or refer to the blog posts. And uh, I would really like to thank uh, my colleagues and everyone who has helped us uh, achieve, bring Pythia to fruition, make it become reality. And um, I will now show you, as promised, how to access um, this. So. On GitHub, you will find my under uh, my account the repository ancient text restoration. Here is everything you need, and this is specifically looking at the README file, the articles, and this will lead you to the CoLab, the Python notebook, which is going to load. You're going to have to open it in playground mode, and this is what I was showing you before. I've used an adapted version to give you all of the examples. But here are here's the famous Apollodorus case. Here is that other inscription from Athens, which and you can uh, fill this part in with the text that you want to uh, restore for your own personal research. And uh, it's all freely accessible online. Um, I want to thank you all very, very much for your attention and uh, welcome any questions you might have. Sorry, thank you, Taya. That was um, that was really great. Um, that's uh, that's possibly the um, the most impressive um, use of sort of predictive. Um, restoration that uh, that I've seen and you know pe people talk about doing this sort of thing all the time and it's, it usually involves being trained um, either just you know on a dictionary or um, you know on a small body of text um, or as you say the you know training it with across Greek literature generally um, and you know leads to you know much more problematic um, results that um, that come uh, that, that, that you know don't come anywhere near what you've um, what you've achieved on there. It's it's it's, it's very impressive. Um, the Thank you. Uh, the question the question I had I guess is um, and you, you sort of hinted on at this at the end, but I wonder if you could maybe expand on this a little bit. Um, how how you see this fitting into the workflow of of an epigrapher? Could you could you imagine how you might use this um, with a text? You know, a newly found text that, that half of it is missing. Um, how would you go from analyzing the text yourself, running it through Pythia, analyzing again, making your final edition? In, in what order might you do things? Um, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm preempting your answer, but, but yeah. <laughs> um, that, it's a very, very good question. So uh, once again, I want to emphasize that this is an assistive tool. So. Uh, what we want to do is sort of to save time, uh, give sort of a, a starting point for the epigraphist to base her or his work, and, uh, and then to sort of open possibilities which, were, which epigraphists could not, uh, were not able of accessing before. This is because Pythia is capable of accessing the entirety of the Greek epigraphic production in a heartbeat, um, which is something which an epigraphist mnemonic parallel, mnemonic um, uh, repertoire of parallels or current string matching approaches just cannot um, cannot fully fulfill. So it's sort of the giving the first answer, but also um, opening doors which. Uh, perhaps had not been previously considered. And the other thing that uh, I want to answer to this question is that Pythia is intended as a, as a starting point, but then uh, the implementations and the next steps uh, in this kind of research are 
uh, as many as, uh, as you can think of on your two feet. So I think that a starting point for epigraphical research, a way of uh, exploring new possibilities, and also a starting block for even more such implementations would be what I envisage Pythia to contribute to ancient historical research. Cool. So you you, you talked in your um, in your presentation about how you tested it by artificially damaging some some inscriptions that yes. that either were not damaged or that we had good restoration for already. Um, have you used it yourself on, a, on, a, on an unpublished inscription that no one has attempted to restore yet? So I have, uh, we have been uh, looking at, uh, I am in the process of publishing, well, rather writing an adapted version of the article uh, which we published for EMNLP for sort of a classics audience. And that would mean uh, evaluating it on uh, inscriptions which have been already restored or on new inscriptions and evaluating sort of the um, the accuracy, how the result fits into the epigraphic habit of the text in question. Um, what we have been seeing so far is very, very promising, but uh, since this project was developed in parallel with my doctorate, which is also something completely different, uh, I haven't yet had the chance to sort of dedicate full-time uh, research on this, but it is in the works. And the results we have so far, which we have looked at with Jonathan and uh, other epigraphists look really, really promising. Great. Thank you. Um, so I don't want to monopolize the questions. There are other people in the um, in the call who might, um, who might have questions they want to ask as well. We've already had four questions on YouTube, five questions now um, coming through from, from YouTube. Um, does anyone in the call want to ask, any, ask anything very quickly? Um, or shall we, shall we go to some of the YouTube questions and then come back to you all? Go ahead, Paola. You need to unmute yourself. Sorry, I always forget to unmute myself. Um, I'm, I have a question because I'm very interested in the cleaning process that you talk about for the inscription. Because, you know, that's a very necessary thing to do when you are dealing with data and it's not very a very popular practice. Like many people consider it very boring and it's difficult to find uh, funding for cleaning data. Um, yeah. So how did you approach that? Who did it? And what happened with the texts that were clean after using them with Pythia? Did you keep that data? Did you put it back or what happened? So um, cleaning the text this is a really good question because data is the most important uh, element, ingredient in all of this research. And it is thanks to the accessibility, the existence of digitized texts that um, text corpora that uh, we can uh, we could implement this research so the text cleaning part was implemented by I, I wrote the regexes and uh, alongside uh, Yanis so the text cleaning part in terms of sort of big challenges which we uh, came upon throughout this research project the text cleaning part was actually one of the the major hurdles that we had to overcome um, I explained to you the the pipeline um, there uh, in uh, in one of the earlier slides. And while we were sort of because we dedicated so much work to it and so many design choices, I think this was also uh, where sort of the interaction between epigraphist and computer scientists could really, really yield the most interesting results because behind every decision, do we clean this, do we keep this, do we change this, uh, there was a huge conversation and sort of lots of um, a methodological epigraphical knowledge had to go into this decision as much as the computer science part. So um, this in terms of sort of big discipline questions. Uh, once we had sort of gotten through uh, this text cleaning process, we decided that uh, we really wanted to inspire um, more work to be, we, we really wanted to promote more work to be done on this kind of data set and that is why we made it all freely accessible on github it can be uh, downloaded to train your own models uh, add new data the text cleaning pipeline is also open source so if there is another data set which you want to be working on we're currently like uh, 
I don't know, a, a Sanskrit, another language, another textual medium that is all there for the taking and for the doing, which uh, I think was the other most important uh, sort of takeaway from this, uh, this, uh, this research project. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's take a couple of questions from YouTube. Yeah. Let's take a couple of questions from YouTube mm -hmm. so we can get through to them. So there's a question from um, Adeline Lee um, asking, what can you do when there isn't clean data of the kind you described? OK, um, so that is a very good question. Uh, we had to, um, uh, we did as, much cleaning as we could. Sometimes we were actually quite radical, sort of deciding, for instance, to exclude all text with less than 100 characters. You could say that's a very radical decision to make, but this goes back to uh, the importance of context, which I emphasized with the um, the attention weights. Uh, text, the, if the performance peaks at around 500 characters, we had to get an arbitrary cutoff point at some point. Um, as far as evaluating if the uh, the regexes, if the text cleaning pipeline was performing accordingly, that involved having to look at a lot of files to make sure that everything was going according to plan. Um, uh, I think that's that's an, an, a potential answer. So a related question also from um, from Fred Chipley talking about clean data. Why? Why do you keep restorations in your clean data? Uh, why do we keep restorations uh, in the data? As in uh, the the restorations that sort of the uh, the original ones. Uh, why we accept uh, sort of the, as uh, as. Um, as reliable the restorations made by expert epigraphists in uh, square brackets, for instance, and integrate those. So uh, we had to make some of these calls based, especially on the Leiden conventions, uh, which parts to, uh, which conventions to keep, which to exclude, which to adapt to the text, uh, to, um, uh, to sort of include in the clean text. And uh, we, we felt it really important to sort of include the effort of epig which epigraphists have been dedicating to uh, creating editions of these texts for centuries. And so a lot of uh, the epigraphic notations, such as restorations, were also included. Um, this is also, for instance, the reason why we decided to maintain, to, uh, uh, equate each uh, potential uh, to, um, how do you say, to uh, equate each character to a uh, a dash, which is sort of making a big, uh, is, is relying on the epigraphists say that this is the final text, that this is how many characters exactly are missing. Uh, we wanted to keep that rather than sort of um making telling the model training the model on suggesting how many characters it thinks should be uh restored here so i think it's also sort of respecting the work of the which epigraphists have dedicated to these texts and a very quick question or at least i assume the answer is is, is fairly quick um is uh Samgad asks um, what about papyri there's a huge amount of data there um for, for for example. Why not papyri? <laughs> I mean, that is that is of course one of the. When I say that uh, the Pythia architecture the model is uh, applicable, is is very versatile. I actually mean it. It can be applied to any language, ancient and modern. So uh, if you want to train it on English, on uh, Sanskrit, on any ancient language, I'm currently working on Latin text restoration. Um, and also on any textual media. So uh, codicology, papyrology, all of these are possibilities. And it's uh, just about adapting the model to um, training the model on this new data, uh, which is, is that it's, it's all possible <laughs> in a way. You your, um, your experience though suggests that you wouldn't use the papyri to train the, um, the epigraphy restoration. So this is 
I would be really interested in investigating that because um, so once again, what we're talking about, it comes back to a data problem. So sort of an extra to that previous question by Usama is uh, which papyri do we want to train the model on? It would have to be at least uh, out of what I, I suspect, uh, it would have to be documentary papyri uh, because a lot of them have been digitized. Uh, literary papyri were still sort of in the process of the digitization uh, effort. So we need a lot, a lot of data. So um, if we are dealing with documentary papyri, then we could perhaps expect the language model to perform uh, better than uh, uh, when it is trained on documentary papyri and epigraphy than on literary text and set to the epigraphic text restoration. We don't know. It would be really, really interesting to find out. And it would also sort of bring us a step closer to fitting in that puzzle of this sort of um, this, uh, this gap, this uh, distinctiveness between an epigraphic and literary culture, which the ablation study showed. So that's also a really interesting line of discussion. And uh, uh, I will come back to the to the in, internal group in a moment, but that comes to um, to Fred's second question, which is um, really the observation that epigraphic texts also include literary texts um, on stone. So that 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 feeds into what you were just saying. I think that it's you know the the, the different genres and the different styles. Um, yes, yes, I understand this question better. Yeah. Sorry, Fred Shipley. Um, yes. So uh, one of the ways in. Oh, sorry. Okay, so um, yes, uh, epigraphic texts are wildly diverse and include also poetry. So um, I was thinking, and this is like, it's it's a continuous work in process and it's also through discussions like these that uh, we can all, we, we can get ideas on how to sort of unpick some of the tangles which still remain uh, to be untangled from this research project. So for instance, how about sort of um, trying to unpick that, dis that uh, um, disconnect between epigraphic and literary culture as proved by the as shown by the ablation study by sort of uh, training the model on literary texts and then setting it to the restoration of metric inscriptions like would that affect the prediction accuracy that is a question which i am personally dying to answer and uh it's it's a very another really productive line of discussion, I think. Very nice. Any other questions from from in the call? Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Thea. That was really really interesting. I'm seeing a lot of very really enthusiastic comments on YouTube. I hope you will like the <laughs> Um, I I am not an epigrapher, so I'm gonna ask the the chaotic question here. So forgive me uh, in advance. Tranquilla. Do you see um, possible applications of this methodology for non-word-based objects, like for example decoration, if they are you know formulaic or you know if they repeat forms? Like, do you imagine in the future that uh, you know, machine learning can be trained to recognize um, fresco motifs or, you know, even 3D shapes from, you know, fragments of pottery, for example. So do you see this going beyond words? So this is a, a really, really good question. All of these questions are great. Um, I think that it is certainly possible. It might even be that there is some strictly machine learning project going on out there where sort of the transfer between domains is, is very easy. It's a baby step. Uh, it's about sort of forging these collaborations between these, uh, these, uh, these domains, which is sort of the, the key point at hand here. Um, I personally disclaimer know very little or nothing about uh, computer vision, but uh, I think that it is, um, 
it's something which should happen. And I think that also it's something which I would personally be really interested to see happening. Also just for inscription, sort of, uh, we must remember that these are these uh, documents are not just text, there's also a material support and we need to be including that sort of materiality into our analysis, into the prediction, uh, maybe, text restoration, but sort of in the uh, if, uh, study of uh, these texts and how they fit into the epigraphic habit, etc. So I think this would be really, really interesting, really, really necessary. And I think that in literally the next couple of years we can we can get to it there's that uh, one of the slides I went through quite fast that of sort of related projects which are also working on this there's a project called Recre uh, I don't know if these are still ongoing or have moved on etc but uh, crowdsourcing uh, cell phone photos of ancient monuments to then through photogrammetry to recreate them in the cases of uh, um, antiquities which have been damaged by conflicts etc like we the it's it's just such a great time frankly to do, be doing ancient world studies right now it's a great time to be <laughs> to be doing ancient history i think and it's really about forging these collaborations and also obviously data where would we be getting thousands of photos of uh, thousands of images of ancient artifacts which we want to be uh, charting pat patterns through that's that's what I think. Yeah, thank you very much. It is very exciting. I agree. <laughs> well, maybe we can add a note to this in the sense that uh, uh, PCI is working <coughs> with transcriptions of inscriptions, of course, but given that they are objects, we have uh, uh, letter shapes. So maybe, of course, in a far future, we can also work on that aspect. Uh, which is still uh, complex, for example, for manuscripts, not to mention papyri, where it's a nightmare, but definitely a further possibility for the future is to work on letters where we can also date them and so identify uh, shape letters and so on. Just uh, to comment, to add a note. No, no, to, absolutely. To the, uh, and I think it would. Area. I think that's absolutely true. And maybe papyri are in fact the next sort of uh, not low hanging fruit because this seems like hideously complicated, but sort of there we, we have a, a larger availability of digitized papyri than we do of epigraphic either photos or squeezes. So, so um, it always goes back to the problem of data. Uh, and I think that papyri would be a really, really productive line of discussion. So I noticed that there are two questions um, on YouTube that are both um, related. They're both about um, Pythia's mistakes. Um, okay. So um, Melina's asked them, have you detected patterns, presumably in the mistakes that, that Pythia makes when they make incorrect um, uh, suggestions? Are there any patterns in it that you notice? And related to that, um, Vivian asked the question, um, have you, um, is Pythia learning from its own mistakes? And are the mistakes that it makes repeatable? I mean, I guess, which I guess is, is partly it's how, how statistical uh, and predictive okay. are they. So um, I'd have, these are really, really good questions. I'm thinking if we did evaluate on that, I think, hmm. I think I, I can't remember exactly that detail of the implementation but i'm i'm really happy to continue this uh, to continue this discussion offline because it is really really interesting feel free by the way to uh text me email me uh ask any other questions uh ask them on github etc if you have any other questions even if you're uh just were, were interesting my colleagues and i to know what you say and i i'm sorry i just i i don't know if we evaluated on what the mistakes were if there were patterns in these mistakes i can't think of instances where we evaluated on that Sorry, cool. I, I'm just I, I I can't remember what the what the detail of that implementation was. I'm really sorry. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Um, so there are a few more questions um on on YouTube. Does anyone else want to ask something in um in the call before I go to the next one? 
Uh, okay, if you're thinking of one, then I'm, uh, I think I've skipped over one. There's this question from um, Matteo here, um, which is, uh, have you done any experiments on comparing the bins of ranked restorations um, with the scholarly conjectures in, in critical apparatus? That's really, really an interesting idea. I had, I, we haven't, I hadn't thought of that. That's, that's really, really an interesting uh, idea. Um, I think that's, that's great. <laughs> um, I think that would be a really useful line of discussion. I think that looking also at sort of the, uh, one of the things which I might like to include or that, I mean, it's, it's open access guys, get at it if you want, uh, would be including sort of the, the exact percentage of certainty that Pythia has for its beam search for each sort of uh, each of the restoration hypotheses, um, so as to sort of evaluate with how much sort of uh, reasonable uh, certainty the epigraphists should be using the restorations, because as we all know, there are just some cases where it has to be uh, a dot dot dot. We have no, uh, we can't re um, reconstruct the text because it's too fragmentary. Um, I think that is a really interesting question and we haven't done it so yeah cool well here uh, the problem i think is that definitely we have missing data because uh, i don't know well yes we miss data for uh, the critical apparatus for inscription so definitely should work on collecting data from the critical apparatus which is difficult because then of course the critical apparatus uh, in this case, it's the Greek, but also many other, for example, abbreviations of this. I know that because we have experience for literature and for critical editions. So definitely, this is something that we, we hope for. So the, this question was very, very important. But again, yeah, I think missing that and clean that. <laughs> Yes. Um, I think, yes, it's, it's again, I, I must be really boring out there. Uh, it's all about the data. So uh, I think that that kind of sort of, if, uh, uh, that would be good in the case of a single inscription where the epigraphist sort of receives the pithy app. This is to reconnect to your uh, first question, Gabby, on sort of what the, the pipeline for the epigraphist should be. And uh, that is, I think, uh, a really important step uh, in using Pythia. But um, all, if we wanted to do that automatically, we would need to scrape the metadata and that is just not available. And it is sadly the case because there is so much other information which we would love to include the sort of um, as additional input conditioning, which uh, is geographical data, chronological data, which uh, is difficult to achieve given the state of the digitization. Yeah, so um, we have several more questions still. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out several questions relatively quickly. Um, I don't know if you want to try and give shortish answers to, to some okay. of It may be impossible to do so, which is, um, which is fine. I'll do my so, best. Actually, there is no short answer to that. Email me. Um, but um, the third, yes. well, three, or four, three or four, I think, um, remaining, remaining questions. So we have um, Daniel Stoeckel has asked, what was the greatest difficulty and where did you have the least um, good results? Okay. Greatest difficulty was definitely the text cleaning. Uh, that was that was the biggest biggest challenge and undertaking. I mean, the whole thing was a challenge from the beginning, bring, bridging sort of classics, ancient history, and machine learning conceptually in practice was a huge challenge. But I think that in practice, the text cleaning part was the biggest hurdle, and the least good results were when we were evaluating all of the different language models, and we saw that the language model that had been trained on uh, literary texts was not performing as well as we had hoped it would because we were thinking, ah, more data, this is great, we can put together Perseus and THI, which just wasn't the case, and we were shocked at how badly it performed, and then really, really encouraged by how well the model was performing uh, when trained on epigraphic data sets and with the word and character architecture. Thank you for the question. Thank you. So there are two um, two questions here which I think are um, also about about the size of lacuna. So I think we could take those together as well. So Scott sure. has asked, 
um, how does Pythia handle um, gaps where the epigrapher is unable to tell us how, how long the gap is? Um, how, do, how does it attempt to, to predict in that case where you just have to say there's a gap? I mean, it, it can say, I can give you two characters or 20 characters. Okay, so uh, that's a really good... Let me give you the related question at the, at the uh, same yeah, sorry. Time. We can possibly um, uh, combine them. Jun has asked um, what, um, how contextual works in this, um, in this sense. So can you restore a really big lacuna um, where there may be several words completely missing or, or, or does it need more context? Than Okay, okay. So contextual is sort of a catch-all word which we're using for sort of patterns in the string of text which can inform the model's predictions. So in the cases that I've been, uh, that I wanted to present to you because I thought they were really sort of um, explicit in terms of what the model is, uh, where the model's attention weights are dedicated to. It's, um, it was personal names, sort of recurring personal names in the same text as a pattern, but it could also be sort of uh, metadata such as uh, um, uh, office names or particular textual formula which recur in certain classes of documents. Uh, that's what I mean by contextual. In terms of uh, big lacuna, how do we deal with those? So uh, in the paper, we say that we deal with gaps of up to, 20, uh, up to 10 consecutive characters. Uh, disclaimer, we trained it up to 20, but in the evaluation, we set it uh, to only do uh, uh, deal with 10 consecutive characters uh, missing. And on the collab, you will, the, the notebook, you will see that uh, you have little knobs at the very beginning of the collab to um, adjust the length, the prediction length. And it goes up to uh, 10. Now, if you're, um, uh, sorry, it, it, let me just check, I'm feeling a bit, oh. uh, Yes, it goes up to 10. I didn't want to give you uh, fake news. So it goes up to 10. If, however, the sequence that the target sequence that you want to restore is over 10, what the model will automatically do is it will split it so that it can deal with the portions 10 by 10 in multiples of 10. So as for uh, what if uh, we don't know how long, how how long the portion of text is and we can't sort of equate missing character with a special character for Pythia to predict. Now, um, it would be really interesting as an implementation to get Pythia to sort of not, um, I mean, the, the, the original observation is that uh, matching lengths is what language modeling is about today. Uh, and so um, that means basically that the model is working if it is matching the length. However, um, a, a really good extension of the project would be to deal with uh, variable length. So this is not straightforward. We would basically let the model decide. We would give it one prediction character, which means extended prediction se sequence. Uh, it's up to you, Pythia. And then the Pythia would uh, go ahead and predict it and then return the end of prediction sign. This, however, would cancel our assumption that uh, we know how many characters we have. And so incorporating that uh, prior epigraphist work and assumptions, which we wanted to include in this work. But um, it's, uh, it's, I think that it is a next step, but with the fact that the gap can be split into multiples of 10, that is also sort of a, a good starting point to uh, reply to the other question of dealing with gaps of variable length. So it is a possible implementation, and uh, it's it's there for the taking. Yeah, cool. And the last um, cluster of questions, I think, um, I can suggest we take together. Um, we have two questions that are related to, again to context and metadata, but but also to to geography. Um, so Dragos mm -hmm. asked, um, uh, is dialect um, a factor in the um, restorations that it suggests? Um, so, for example, if it, if it suggests a Doric, an Attic word in a Doric inscription, mm -hmm. um, is, that, is that an issue? Um, and I think um, possibly um, related to the answer to that, or I would imagine, um, Laura asks, um, 
um, yeah, with um, uh, does does type of instruction and geographical area, these sorts of things, are they, are they able to feed into the algorithms for likely restorations? Okay, so um, these are really good questions. To answer the last one first, um, actually to answer both. So from what we can see, uh, the dialectic varieties, the dialectic specificities in text do, um, Pythia is paying attention to those from the examples which we looked at. And uh, I would like to sort of make a precise evaluation of that, look at some precise examples of that more um, more in detail, but from what we can see, uh, it would uh, it respects the dialect, and this is again to show uh, what the context information, what all of that context that I'm saying, the length of the text uh, really plays an important role. Um, so whereas context, context includes, so so in this case, um, if I understand correctly, context includes the dialect of the rest of the existing inscription that, that, that yes in. in the context in the widest sense it could be a linguistic peculiarity or a uh the the this a saying a, a formula such as uh, the council of the athenians or a specific uh role an office uh, uh these kinds of this kind of pattern i i use these catch-all terms because literally anything could help Pythia's mm -hmm. hypotheses of restoration. And so we want to uh, amplify that potential as much as possible by giving as much characters, as, as much uh, character length as possible, which is shown as that, uh, that logarithmic scale, the performance peaks at 500 characters. So as you will, oh, sorry. But it's all things internal to the text. So yes. Far, the text itself, not, not what Lara's asking about the, um, the uh, you know, tags that, yes. that might be on the on the edition. Exactly, which means leads me to the the second uh, the second uh, part of the answer, which is it would be fantastic to have as additional input conditioning the geographical and the chronological uh, metadata, but it comes down to a lack of uh, of data basically because in PHI, yes, the inscriptions are uh, indexed by region and subregion, but have you looked? That the PHI metadata for chronology, it's, uh, it's very inconsistent, it's very, very noisy, and we, it would be, it remains to be ascertained whether including that metadata would improve the accuracy of Pythia's restorations. It might, it might even lower the accuracy, uh, we don't know. It is a very, very interesting question. Um, but uh, it's it's again uh, an issue with the data which we are training the model on at the moment. I think it is possible, just as an aside, to um, to clean up the, um, the the chronological data in PHI. Um, I mean, it's it's a relatively. I, I think I mean, one could with possibly just a few hours' work with regular expressions go through and you know because we can always see what they mean even if one says you know one to two meaning first to second century and another says 150 to 350 um you know we can you know start to normalize those because there's a limited number of um weird and messy forms in there so i think an experiment in cleaning that up might be might be possible and then yeah whether that would just end up shrinking your data set because you know it pays more attention to things from the same century or, or and as you say might make it worse so the reason I that that's a fair point. The reason I said that it's a mess is because I'm currently doing precisely that uh, as um, my postdoctoral research. Pro I'm currently applying to for postdocs to uh, bring forward this research and to use machine learning models to study ancient epigraphic cultures of the Greek and Roman world, doing some topic modeling. Uh, including the epigra Latin epigraphical restoration and uh, to study epigraphic habits of the Greek and Roman world going beyond sort of localized case studies. And for that, you need that geographical and chronological data from a database as unparalleled such as PHI. And just doing some first text, I have to say, Gabby, this is really, really hard and time consuming, but um, we get that. And uh, yes, 
And maybe it's the fact that I'm doing it from my parents' uh, <laughs> the sitting room because of the Italian lockdown <laughs> that is making it so hard to focus. Shout out to my parents who are hosting me. <laughs> So the final question, I believe, is a very short, um, a very short answer, um, which is uh, simply when when can we have your 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 data on Latin epigraphy as well? When, when, when's that going to be available? In phase three. Okay. <laughs> no, no, uh, I'm working on it. I um, I'm I'm working on it. That's that's all I can say, guys. It's uh, it's uh, the lockdown was unexpected for. A lot of reasons, and uh, for and has uh, caught up on a lot of pro ongoing projects, and Latin was one of them. But I'm working on it. Great. Um, and I have to say, I, I apologise if I've missed any questions because I, I think I got them all. But for every question in the YouTube comments, there were ten comments saying, "Thank you so much, Taya. This is fantastic." Um, thank you, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think I, I would echo that. This um, this is. Um, you know, very, 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 very cool project. Are there any um, final questions from from inside inside the call before we um, before we go? Yeah. Okay, then I can just repeat. Thank you, um, thank you again. Um, this has been an absolutely um, wonderful start to the uh, 2020 series. Um, yes, normally this would be the point at which we would have uh, deafening applause. Uh, and, uh, so thank you so much. I'll fill the silence uh, thanking my uh, colleagues, uh, Yanis and Jonathan, for uh, making this all possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, everyone. And to everyone watching um, uh, at home, please join us next week when um, uh, William Guru will be talking about late antique prosopography and Socrates' scholastic ecclesiastical history, uh, which will also be very cool. Thank you.